I don't know whether you can see this, but the flower is turning pink where the ants are squirting it with formic acid. To give you some idea of how strong a change that was, there's some unaffected flowers for comparison. Isn't that incredible? It's like litmus paper. You can do this with a lot of flowers, bluebells, harebells, wood anemones. Amazing. If you get too close to one of these nests when you disturb it and the formic acid comes up, it's choking. It's a very effective defence mechanism. Let's have some of these adults. You like ants, don't you? No, I like the flavour of these adults. Sharp. Mm. Nice and vinegary. Mm. Best, to, best to kill them before you eat them. Uh, so you've got to get your tongue out of it. This is true. My, my grandsons love them. Um, after you taught me how to, how to get these um, PPN larvae out, we've been, been visiting a few nests, and uh, uh, we generally uh, uh, dry fry them. Yeah, they're very nice. They and, like shrimp, uh, aren't they? Yeah, they and uh, they've worked very well. And, uh, they, but they also, they also like the adults. It's a clever method of getting the ants to, to, to do the collecting. But I guess our ancestors could have got a clue to using these for food by seeing the nests raided by green woodpeckers and ah, by badgers. Ah, yes. And they'd have had a look and in your natural inquisitiveness and it leads the way, doesn't it, really? That's right. Oh, there's some oh, there. nice pupae here. Let's get a look at those. Not much of a taste. Very bland. No, they're very bland, aren't they? And they're hardly any being collected. I, I think we're about a week too late, probably. Yes. This nest is shutting down now. Well, I think what we, we can do is collect this up and put it back in the yeah, nest and the nest. help them and then uh, maybe some other hunter-gatherers will come next year and help themselves. We think of summer as bountiful, but even in this season of plenty, slight local variations in climate can massively change not only the quality of what's available, but also when it's in its prime. So the ant harvest was disappointing, but we're on song with the berries. Oh, Gordon, that really is a remarkable harvest. We've done pretty well, haven't we? <laughs> Amazingly well. Good array of these, so shall we put on the yeah, tray? Yeah, put some on there, mate. Yeah, put the space for the lingon, that's massive, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's one really interests me, the lingon. Yeah. And then we've got elderberry. When we were kids, we used to shoot these from catapults in a in an early form of paintball. <laughs> and our mothers didn't like it because of the... Uh, yes, the stain is very, very tenacious, isn't it? Yeah. Bird cherry. There's now there's a lot of uh, cyanide in that. That's right, and uh, of course uh, they use those same chemicals from uh, uh, cherry pips uh, to get rid of lice, head lice. So what an array! Each berry has different qualities. The rose hips are full of vitamin C, with seeds covered in irritating hairs, perfect for use as itching powder. Bird cherries can be made edible by grinding them, stone and all, then heating them, which drives off the cyanide they contain to give a tasty biscuit. It's a recipe I'm glad Gordon tried first. I, I, can, eat, I, can, eat a, I can eat a lot of this. Whether the, the, the teeth would survive it is another matter. Quite crunchy. Native people in Russia have relied on these fruits and also in northern cultures, cowberries are used widely as a preservative. Both in combination with meat and alone in clear water, they'll last for months. Virtues that would not have been lost on our ancestors. All that venison back at camp is crying out for one more berry that's around here and ripe for the picking. This tree bears another edible berry. This is juniper, of course famous for gin. But one of the other uses of juniper berries is to season wild venison, for which it excels. For that reason, I'm going to collect a whole load. A bit small this year, which is probably a product of the long, hot summer. But despite that, I've got that wonderfully aromatic flavour. Beautiful. One of the great things about juniper berries, of course, is once you've got them dried, they last for ages. Just the most amazing thing to put in a marinade of venison. A bit of red wine, a few juniper berries, and you're laughing. I'm not sure Gordon will approve, it's not very archaeological. However, 
It's very tasty. I know what he'll say. So now what's the evidence for the use of red wine in the Mesolithic? <laughs> None. Didn't they just wish they had it? Well, they may be small, but they really make up for it in their potency. I'm not going to need many of these. In fact, I think I've got enough now. Brilliant. Probably noticed I brought a few cooking utensils a with few me. Indeed, yes, a rather impressive array. Well, I thought it was time we actually cooked something a little bit more conventional with some of the wild stuff we've got with us. What Fancy. I, what I have in mind is um, not to cook all wild things. I think we're going to mix a little bit of modern and a little bit of old and yeah. we'll do it outdoors and ah. see what we come up with. I really enjoy the whole process from hunting, selecting the deer, hunting the deer and uh, butchering it to cooking it. The whole process is magic. You're completely in touch with your food. And a venison casserole is just a classic dish of the woods. And to go with it, I have a spectacular and unusual dessert, for which I need one key wild ingredient, and Gordon's on the case. Now, there are three types of sorrel in Britain that are common. We have the wood sorrel, which is, has leaves a bit like a clover. Um, and the uh, sheep sorrel, which is quite small, has little arrow-shaped leaves, and then the common sorrel, which is what we have here, which is the one that Ray needs for his cookery. All three sorrels have a, a very distinctive taste, um, and uh, if we try this... Mm. Sour, a, a, a very, very uh, sharp taste, a bit like lemon, so let's go gathering. What I want to do is just brown this meat off. Mm -hmm. It's starting to smell good. Now I'm going to add the garlic. I didn't add it earlier because I didn't want to toast it. I just want it to do its thing in a very natural way. So in the marinade, a um, good bottle of red wine, some bay leaves, some thyme, some carrot, celery, um, and juniper berries. Now, to make the stock, what I've got here is the bones that we took the meat from. We may have changed many aspects of how we live since the Mesolithic, but one thing that hasn't changed is our physiology. By eating what was fresh and seasonal, our ancestors had a diet we would recognise as extremely healthy today. Now, I'm going to add that to the meat in there. So by using the same wild ingredients, we can still provide our bodies with the diversity of foods we need, even if we've brought the recipes up to date. There we go. Now it's going to sit there and cook for most of the day, nice and slowly, gently. And for pudding, the sorrel's been roughly shredded to make a treat for Gordon. What has to happen to this now? I'm going to put some hot water in there. I have to boil this down. In fact, I have to boil it until it boils dry. Just on. It's quite tricky. If I overboil it, obviously it'll scorch. I don't want that to happen. That's going to go on there. Put the lid on until it comes up to a good boil and then I will take the lid off and raise it up a little bit so I can watch what's going on. Because what I want to make are some tartlets with the sorrel. It's rather a surprising recipe. So, first job. I've got some little tartlet dishes here which I've greased. 